Ghost Cult Magazine is honored to welcome in music legend Lee Aaron. How are you today, Lee? I'm I'm doing good, actually. The weather, I'm I'm on the west coast of Canada, and the weather's beautiful today. And I'm gonna be setting up some little tents later for, for my my son because he's actually for the very first time in months and months, because COVID is starting to the levels are starting to go down here. He's actually gonna have a socially distanced camp out in our acreage property with his buddies tonight. So um, I'm excited for him. <laughs> that's amazing. And you know, that's a, a really good place to start. Obviously you're releasing an album at the tail end of this global crisis. And thank goodness for new music. It has definitely kept me going this whole oh, time. Tell me but, about it. Yeah. But what a tough time in the world. And just before I, before I begin all these kind of the same way, or at some point, I, I want to just make sure you're well, your family, your collaborators. It's been just such a tough time. People have lost a lot of stuff, and I don't want to be insensitive to that. Well, that has been one of my big concerns through this whole thing, is I've been checking in periodically with the guys in my band, like, how are you guys doing? How's your family? Because we're a bi-coastal band, my guitar player. Sean Kelly is uh, located in Toronto and the rest of us live on the West Coast, although my drummer, my drummer is my husband, John and I, of course, live in the same home, but um, my bass player, Dave Reimer, is uh, about an hour away from us in the city of Vancouver and his partner is on the one of the islands. So, you know, it's been, yeah, it's been a concern and um, and I've been, you know, my former guitar player, John Albany, I've been checking in with him. He lives in Nashville now. I'm like, dude, how are you doing? You know, because I'm, I still love him and I still care about him. Um, and very sadly, one of another one of our former guitar players did pass away from COVID. Mm. So it was, and it was really shocking because um, it was sort of the first time I, that it really touched my life personally. And I kind of freaked out for a few days. I was like, you know, with my kids, I'm like, you, you know, you wear your masks at school and you do this. Like I just, all of a sudden COVID became really, really, really real. I mean, it feels real because we're all wearing masks and we're sanitizing and all that stuff, but I didn't know anyone personally that had actually gotten sick, really sick or passed away from COVID. And that was the first, and that was the end of April. And mm -hmm. it's like, we people were starting to get vaccines and it's like, how crazy is that? That at the very, very sort of, um, tail end of this when we think we're taking an upturn everyone's starting to get vaccinated that we lose a former band member right so it was it was pretty devastating and i'm so sorry and that sucks yeah. terribly and uh and for anybody that's lost anything not to mention you know i always think about us we're, we're such an official music industry and we're in a very symbiotic relationship artists touring venues journalists photographers we're all kind of interrelated on tree branch and so I know it's been very personal and intense. Like we lost our careers, we lost our money, but there's also this huge thing going on with everybody. And it's uh, probably for the first time in most of our lives uh, in this part of the world. So it's just been something that's been present with me. Um, even if you're not in it, I found that even people who aren't empathetic, if you found that's like six degrees of separation, you either know a frontline healthcare worker, you know a yeah. doctor, you know someone who's had this and yeah. either had it and beat it or had it and lost. And even some of the artists I've interviewed recently were like, yeah, at the beginning of this thing, I was really uh, watching the wrong news and not following it. And then I realized I was wrong and I had to take this a lot more seriously because somebody I knew got it. And I was like, I think it becomes because it's a, you know, it's a virus and it's invisible until it affects you. It's not yeah. real. You know, if we were all, all suddenly had leprosy, you could see it and it'd be like, oh my God, that's horrible. Like a horror movie, but like it is yeah. a real life. It's been a real life horror show for a lot of people. And I'm, yeah. I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah, well, thanks. So, yeah, it was pretty, yeah. not, not a fun thing to find out. But yeah, uh, I know we, um, <clears throat> we started recording radio on, believe it or not, that, you know, that week in the middle of March <laughs> where all of a sudden it was just frontline news every single outlet was talking about this COVID thing. We, we were suddenly getting all the news about all these people, like masses of people dying in Italy. Do you remember this? Yeah. And we were, we had had recording time booked because we were going in, like I'm a real big believer that there's no way I'm gonna do a record unless I do bed tracks live off the floor. I don't, um, I know a lot of people record just by doing it to a click and sending files back and forth, but it's, I'm kind of old school that way. I think, you know, I, I want us all to be in the same room reading, you know, making eye contact, reading each other's mail, um, because I think that that's the only way real music happens and spontaneity happens. But 
you know, the, the second day we were in the studio, everybody was kind of freaking out and, and the engineers were freaking out and they were like, we, we normally, my husband and I normally bring our own children into the studio with us every time we've done a record just to hang in the background and eat snacks and just sort of observing the process because, you know, we're, we're, we're a musical family and we just want them to see this is what it's like in a world-class recording studio and whether, you know, we believe in the arts and this could be your future too. And the recording studio is like, you're not bringing your kids here, it's COVID. So we were like, you know, struggling to find, um, you know, someone to house sit and look after our kids for a few days when we were in the studio. So it was, it was very, uh, almost a surreal process, right? Right, we all had to get outside of our comfort zones, whatever those were right away. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I certainly remember my last public event and I'm looking forward to my first one soon. <laughs> And, and you, of course, I, I often touch on this because I talk to a lot of vocalists, you sing for a living on stage, in front of people, sometimes in close proximity, yelling, as I love to say, a singer's yell into an electric stick. And so you have to <laughs> yell into this thing in front of people with your voice and you're, you're vulnerable. When, when will you feel safe to start performing live? Have you already started performing live in this no. period of time? Oh, I know yeah. Vancouver is oh. a little more relaxed than, or the British Columbia has been a little better, less hit and more relaxed than the rest of like Eastern Canada. Yeah, BC is actually doing pretty good. We're, um, <clears throat> you know, we also have a lot of open area here where, so it's been um, okay in terms of, um, put it this way, if you're stuck in the city of Toronto, megapolis of Toronto, it's a, it's a little harder to escape being around other people um, when you're trying to do anything, even we'll go for a walk around the block, but you know, um, in BC, we have a lot of open space, a lot of nature out here. So we just got into a routine as a family of, you know, going for like a hike every day at one of our provincial parks, because we live in proximity to several of them. And I think I'm going to keep that routine because I feel healthier. And <clears throat> so we have a lot of fresh air. <clears throat> so I don't know if that's been helpful for people who live in British Columbia. But in terms of getting back on the road and playing live, um, all of my <clears throat> larger festival shows that were overseas and have been pushed to 2022 and we were even uh we were supposed to be on monsters of rock cruise this year and that is tentatively i'll say tentatively even though they're selling tickets is pushed to uh, february 2022 truthfully i wasn't comfortable getting on a ship that soon so i think we will end up on the 2023 monsters of rock cruise um to me, doing a ship seems a little scarier because you're kind of on a floating, you know, a floating device with a, a bunch of other people where you can't escape. And I actually have a very good girlfriend. Um, we used to do jazz together and she was a music director on the Princess Q Cruises and she actually got stuck at sea for like seven weeks. They they wouldn't let, they would let them dock to get supplies, but because they they took three bodies off her ship, the people that died of COVID. And they're like, they just wouldn't let them land anywhere. And then when they did, finally, they were allowed to dock somewhere. Um, she was put in a position where she was, uh, you know, quarantined at a hotel for a couple of weeks and she was moved to another hotel. Then she couldn't get out of the States and come back to Canada. And it was very complex and um, scary. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, sure. So I think it's gonna be Canada, Canadian bands in Canada to start. And um, at this point, it looks like I may have uh, a couple of shows, two or three shows coming up in the fall here, like larger either festival and or cas casino showrooms. And um, so I'm really looking forward to doing that. But I know that there's going to be a lot of safety protocols. So I think October is maybe the time frame we're looking at at this point in time. And that's only if things continue to get better. I think everybody's sort of thinking, yes, we're going to book shows. But if things take a sudden turn like they did in India, everything's going to get rolled back, right? It's right. just so hard to say at this point because there's so many bizarre variants and things going, you know, out it's there. Totally so. true. A ship, by the way, I used to work in travel. A ship is a floating petri dish. Let's just get real. And you're, you know, everybody's drinking and partying, and no, it's it's just like I said this about certain types of certain genres of rock and heavy metal. Just they, they require intimacy. We just it's a communal experience. We want to be close true. together. We want to be at the front, waving the horns and screaming our hearts out. And it's rough. It's rough for us. Um, 
you know, also I, I, um, I definitely have to say, yeah, I think, I think it's going to be a process. And what I'm hopeful is that we open up slow and cautiously optimistic, and then it, we stay open. I would hate for us to re, you know, all these things are being booked. I'm so happy to see festivals and get tour press in my inbox. So happy, but then I don't want to see it go back, you know, revert and it could happen. I hope not. <clears throat> yeah. I'm, I'm very, very hopeful. It's going to stay, you know, on an upward slope, but, um, but it's, you know, I think we're just, the whole world is learning as we go, because now with these variants, you know, we are going to, they're going to have to be designing new vaccines every year. It's going to be like the flu shot, right? We're going to have to get them every year. And each year they're going to be trying to figure out what are the most deadly variants and how do we deal with that and put the most, the best preventative measures um, and the, the most preventative medicine in this vaccine for people, right? Mm. So... I, yeah, it's, I'm not a health expert, but that's from talking with some uh, doctor friends or people that I do know on the front lines, that's, that's looking like it's going to look, but we should talk more about music. This We're is going to. negative. <laughs> no, no. And I, and certainly I don't want to be negative because yeah. I want you to get out on the road and play this magnificent album live. So Radio On is fantastic. I've been jamming it out along with all your catalog stuff, my old favorites and, and all these things. And uh, what I love about this radio, it really, the radio on it really is like a playlist. It's super, I, I'm a big fan. I grew up on records. I know vinyl is very in vogue again, thankfully, but for artists, but I'm, I grew up on records and I love a complete album and I love sequencing and I love like a side A and a side B. And I really love the care you took, like these songs just flow together beautifully. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm big on, uh, trying to come up with a good running order. And yeah, so Dave Reimer and I did that. Um, unfortunately, Sean Kelly wasn't able to come out for the mixing of the album with Mike Fraser because he was back in Toronto. And at that point, all the flights were shut down. But <clears throat> thankfully, um, we were able to get into the studio in Vancouver with the um, amazing Mike Fraser and work on mixing the record. And Dave uh, Reimer, my, my bass player, actually lives literally up the street from the studio where we did the mixes. So he was able to join me every day. And that, yeah, the last couple of days in the studio before we were sending it off to mastering, we're like, okay, dude, we gotta come up with a good running order. So I'm very conscientious that way in terms of, um, I love coming up with, yeah, where it's, it's just got a good flow. It's like, okay, I hear, you know, the key of this song ending and then the key of this song kicking in and the tempo. And so I'm, I really think those things through in terms of, you know, what key is the song in? How does the flow go? You know, is it a, does it feel like it needs to go into a more up tempo, kick into a more up tempo thing now? Or um, can we give the, the, the listener a sonic break? You know, I love... <clears throat> Some of my favorite, favorite albums from when I was a kid, like a young teen, were albums, you know, that were that were like that. Like, you know, I know it's like one of the world's most popular albums, but Rumors by Fleetwood Mac, you know, it's just got a, per it's like a perfect playlist. And, um, and the other thing that I love about albums like that is the fact that, <clears throat> you know, I know a lot of hard rock, certainly in the hard rock and metal genre, you know, a lot of the times it's, you know, fist pumping, you know, all the way through the entire album. But I personally like to, um, sorry, my, my daughter's running water over there. I'm like, shh, <laughs> I'm doing a Zoom interview. Um, I like albums that feel like a journey when you're listening to them. So it's sort of like, it takes you on a journey to these places and each song provides some something different emotionally for you and uh yeah so if, if you're if you're digging that you're feeling that then i my mission's accomplished nice right? yeah it's great and i love the diversity there's all kinds of different tracks i love 21 is is hard not to get a little emotional listening to that song uh beautiful beautiful ballad uh interesting that you put it at the very end kind of like as a period on the end of this whole otherwise rocking thing uh, uh, up and down any any thoughts on the 21 song well, it was purposely put at the end of the album. <clears throat> I know that um, when we recorded it, like sometimes we record things and we're not sure 100%, is it going to be just an ending or a fade, right? Are we going to fade it in the mastering or, or the mixing process? Because um, that song is over five minutes long. And so it certainly doesn't have, um, it wasn't really intended, how do I explain it? 
when we made this record, we weren't thinking, oh, we have to write singles. We have to design these for radio singles because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a legacy act. And, and you, know, you know, the hope of getting on pop culture radio is not something that's really so much on my radar. So I'm more writing for me and my fans. And um, we just couldn't find a good place to edit 21. We're like, it just needs to be six minutes long, you know? And so um, it just seemed like it belonged at the end of the record as a sort of an, almost like a nostalgic experience that closes the record. And um, yeah, the song was, that's, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about and has been on my mind, I guess, as we, we grow older and we, we lose friends, we lose family. My mom passed away three years ago. Um, my sister's husband, my sister who is younger than me, lost her hu husband suddenly two years ago. Um, we've lost so many wonderful rock stars, people we didn't fit, we thought, people to me that seemed young and vibrant still, like Bowie, like Prince, like Lemmy, uh, you know, and, um, you know, so mortality has been on my mind, I have to be honest, the song Radio On, and so when I wrote 21, it was sort of like, man, where, where's, I have these like moments, like every few days of my life, I go, what? Like, where did the time go? Like, I, that doesn't feel like it was, you know, I was reading an article with Shirley Manson from Garbage, you know, in the paper yesterday. I'm like, they did those albums like 30 years ago? It doesn't feel like 30 years ago. It feels like 10 years ago, maybe, you know? And where does the time go? And I don't know about you, but, you know, I might, you know, I might have the odd little ache and pain here, but I still, in my brain, I feel like I'm in my 20s because that's just where I'm at socio-emotionally, I think, in many ways, right? And, um, I don't know. It's so, 21 was kind of written as a love letter to my fans that have grown up with me and that, uh, that are feeling that same feeling. Like, hey, you know, I guess we've, you know, we've lived through a lot and we're survivors and that's what 21 is about. Nice. And it is a fun, it is a very fun rocking record. I love Bampin and Come On and uh, Russian Doll was actually one of my favorites and Soho Crawl and things like that. So it's a very fun, uh, you know, vampy kind of record. You sound amazing. I, I was going to ask you, how do you keep your voice in shape? You sound the same as, you know, many years ago without any real change to me, a listener. So I don't know how you do it, but how do you keep your voice in, in fighting shape? Um, well, thanks. I, uh, the, the last few years especially um i and i've told this story a couple of times but about 11 years ago i got very very ill i was just my kids were really little i was just totally run down with early motherhood and you know all that that entails and um i ended up getting pneumonia but and then i ended up with bilateral pneumonia it means fluid in both your lungs i was i was so sick and i i had to go see a couple of specialists i was I had to see a respirologist because I literally could not breathe. And he had me on all these inhalers and they, the doctors put me on a variety of different rounds of antibiotics. So about three months later, when I was finally getting over this and feeling better, I was getting better. But the only problem was I was talking like this. I literally had completely lost my voice. And I had, I saw a few vocal specialists like, um, like throat specialists and they, they, they couldn't figure out what was going on. And I was, I was freaked out. This went on for weeks and I was like, holy crap, is, the, is that it? Is my career over? Have I lost my voice forever? And am I never going to sing again? And I finally got connected with the top vocal cord specialist in Vancouver at VGH hospital. And he took one look down there. Like it's, it's very bizarre. They put like literally a camera down your throat. And he said, oh my goodness. He said, you have like a monster thrush infection on your vocal cords. And he said it's from all the, um, the steroid inhalers they've been giving me for breathing. Why none of the other ear, nose and throat specialists caught that, I'm not sure, but he caught it right away because he, he treats all the top vocalists in the city. And um, the good news is I got healed. He prescribed the right meds. I lit, don't laugh, laugh. I literally, had to get cortisone injections right into my neck. He put them right into my neck. They, it looked, was like a clockwork orange moment, trust me. Um, but I got fixed up 
And all I can tell you is after that, I was like, I am never going to deal with that again. It frightened me because I thought, honestly, that's it. If I don't have my vocal, my, my vocal cords are my livelihood. They are my career. And if I don't have my voice, I've got nothing. So I became, I completely changed my diet after that. I, so all I'm going to tell you is I take extremely good care of myself now. Um, if it comes out of the earth or from an animal that eats grass, I eat it, but otherwise I don't. I'm, 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 I have a very, very um, strict, healthy diet. I get a lot of sleep. I try to get a lot of sleep is paramount for your vocal cords. I try to get sufficient sleep. I don't really do anything that special, <laughs> but um, I really do take good care of my voice. I don't abuse myself obviously with substances because it's, it, it's, it's the death of your vocal cords, you know? That's all I can say. And I always take sufficient time to warm up my voice before I'm touring, before I'm playing a show, before I'm recording in the studio. You don't go to the gym and lift 150 pounds over your head without warming up to that, right? You can't do it with your vocal cords either. They're a muscle. You have to treat them with respect and care, right? Good advice. Good advice. Uh, yeah, I always wonder about, I don't know how certain singers just, they wild out and then they're okay to sing. Some people I think are just very naturally, they have just a naturally rubbery <laughs> vocal cords that are, could sustain smoking and other craziness. But uh, yeah, I can never found any of that stuff conducive. That's awesome that you take such good care of yourself and uh, you bounce back from that thing. I know that a few people, uh, a few vocalists I talked to who had the COVID had trouble getting their power back a little bit. So that's also a thing I think that's uh, a lot of singers take for granted. You don't have to worry about it as much when you're younger and your body is very resilient like a little child. Yeah, you just fall and get right back mm -hmm. up. And as you get older, you need to maintain that balance. So that's awesome. Um, I love how um, we talked a little bit about it in 21, but I love how you get into character in your lyrics and into vocal. You know, your character comes through not just in words, but in your voice with sort of not, you know, not about necessarily melodies and notes, but just what you do with the characters in your lyrics. So I always, you know, I was always curious about your lyric writing and, you know, how you get into sort of the mindset of inhabiting these different characters that go, you know, inha inhabit the songs that are not personally about you. Um, well, there's, you know, I think that there's a little bit of personal, personal um, edge to almost everything that I write, whether it's um, about, say, a friend's experience or my own personal experience, or I find that with lyric writing, what I can do, what I like to do now is I go back and I mine experiences from my past that I can bring forward to present day. Um, you know, so for instance, like a song like Mama Don't Remember, um, it was just that song in particular was about a time in my life where um, I had become particularly disenfranchised with the music industry and the whole rock and roll lifestyle per se. Um, all the guys in my band were still partying. It's not the current band that I have right now. Um, and you know, they were all getting a little older and still behaving like they were 20. And I'm going, you know, like, this is just not so fun anymore. And um, we'd come off a big festival that day and we'd gotten into a limo with a driver who I suspect was actually drinking when he was driving us. He put down the barricade window between, you know, the clients and the driver and he wanted to party with us. And then he got us lost in the Canadian outback somewhere. And I was the only, I was the only one sober in the back seat going, I don't know about you guys, but I'm freaking out. Is this guy gonna like drive us into the middle of the woods and ax murder us all? Like, you know, and then I was trying to find a map. This is pre GPS days. I was pull, pulled, you know, I went under the seat. I was looking through the drawers underneath the seats in the limo, trying to find a map. And all I could find were pornographic magazines. And I'm going, this guy is scaring me. And so I was able to go in, back and mine that experience from like 20 years ago and go, you know, and come up with this song, Mama Don't Remember. Um, you know, my, my bass player, uh, Dave, had actually bought in, brought in the uh, initial riff and he had, the only line he had was that, my mama don't remember my name. And I'm like, okay, I can connect this with an experience that I've had in the past and make this a song about disenfranchisement of with the rock and roll lifestyle. and. Um, so yeah, and then of course I'm going to sing that song with a different type of edge than I'm going to approach a song 
like 21, if that makes sense, right? Because that's, it's got, it's got more anger, right? And so, uh, yeah, so I mean, that's, I guess that's what I can tell you. And then, you know, like a song, like Wasted, um, my guitarist, Sean, he brought in this beautiful, um, you know, verse and pre-chorus section um, that he was playing on acoustic. And I'm like, oh man, like, I love that. I like, it reminds me of like Zeppelin over the hills and far away. But what I feel for this is that what I, my vision for that song was I hear these verses being sung in almost like a childlike, very innocent way. And then it kicks into this like really heavy chorus part and gets ugly because this person is addressing something very serious. So I conceptually, I had that idea for the song before we finished it, but I wasn't sure what I was gonna write it about. And then, cause all I had was the line, I'd rather be wasted. I thought, well, I can't, you know, I'm like, I'm over 40. Most of my fans are over 45. Like I can't just sing a song about getting wasted. That's just stupid. Like, because, you know, if you're, you know, the age we are now and you're writing songs about, you know, getting wasted, it's like get a life, right? It's like we, I think we can write something, weave this into something much deeper and more meaningful than just a party song, right? So um, yeah, and then I just decided to write it about um, addiction because I think old or young or, you know, um, we've all, I, I, and you know, a few people have brought that song up to me and as something that's touched them very personally because it, I think anyone has, whether it's an immediate family member or extended family me member has um, had that uh, touch their lives in some way, right? So that's what that song ended up being about. Nice. And yeah, when those, those choruses happen, I don't know, I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love it. You have been, you started so young and you had such a long career. You came from the era where albums were everything and now we have streaming and you actually have some very successful songs over at streaming and, uh, and Radio One is coming out on the excellent Metal Bill Records. I wanted to shout that out very soon. Um, you know, what's your thoughts on the way the music industry is going? You have been both DIY and a major label artist in the past. Yeah, no, I'm kind of a combo of both because I, I actually, um, the model that I'm working off these days is like, um, you know, sort of entrepreneurial. I, um, I do all of the, I finance all of the recording, all of the artwork. I do everything myself. So when I'm going to a label for a distribute, like Metalville is my distributor. Um, but we partner in a more intimate way than just uh, distribution. Like we work together, um, but I'm handing them a fully completed artistic product in terms of artwork, music, you know, song selection. Um, and I like that. I love the fact that I'm 100% in charge. So it's my own label, Big Sister Records, partnering with Metalville for distribution around the world. Again, again we're working fairly intimately, but... Um, I, I love that, you know, I have full, complete artistic control over my product now. I feel that there's no compromising in the way that I'm marketed or the way I want to present myself to the world. And now I think I've gone a little bit off, off track. What exactly was your question again? Oh, no, just the, you know, the comparison between being, you know, the oh, early yeah. days of the major labels and big sales, physical sales only. And now we have streaming and all these other opportunities, plus or minus, depending on your experience. You know... Unfortunately, it's a bit of a different world landscape now with digital um, and streaming. People aren't, I'm not making records to get rich. I'm, I, you know, I'm, it's just, it's almost like it's an advertisement for your live show. Um, because that's really how artists are able to make some money. We're not making a ton of money off records anymore. You know, um, the good news is for me, being um, a more mature artist that is a, like a legacy artist, my audience still likes to buy physical products. So they, I'm one of the rare artists where I'm gonna get signed because 
they know that my audience is going to buy CDs. They're going to buy vinyl. Um, I'm not relying on huge streaming numbers to sell my records um, or to put my music into people's ears, right? Um, for me, though, I'm compelled. I just have, I, I don't know how to explain it. <clears throat> I just love making music and still creating. And, you know, I know a lot of my contemporaries don't even make records anymore because they feel it's not worth it. They continue to just tour and do live shows on piggybacking on their old hits. And that's fine. That's great for some people. But, you know, um, I, I, I'm just a different type of artist than that. I mean, I could be doing that. I could just go out there and play What You Do To My Body and Metal Queen and, you know, only human in my, you know, power line for the rest of my life. And they, they do have a place in my live show because I know they make people happy. They bring people a lot of joy. Um, and I get a lot of joy playing them. But <clears throat> I'm one of the few artists that can actually go out and play a live show that contains about half new material and people are digging it, you know, and I, that makes me extremely happy. I'm not ready to stop writing and recording new music. I, you know, in a weird way, I felt like my career was just getting started when I had some of my biggest hits. Then grunge happened. And as you know, all of the artists that were attached to hard rock at that time or corporate rock, or I, I hesitate to use the word hair metal because it, to me, it, it's, it's a very um, uh, diminishing term. And I think that there, yes, there was a lot of crappy hair metal, but I think that there were the bands that started early enough, like me when I was a teenager, you know, there were a lot of bands that were very authentic and making very good music within that genre. But our, all of our careers just fell off the edge of a cliff when grunge happened because the media just wasn't gonna support that music anymore. Um, <clears throat> that's just the way it went. And I felt like, wow, I was just getting going here. And then that happened. So um, two things, I took a diversion. I did some alternate music. I did jazz, I did uh, an opera. Um, I loved that period in my career doing jazz and blues. And then I had my children. So from 2004 until 2016, when I put out another rock record, I took a hiatus from recording and became a mom and I raised my kids. And so when I came back in 2016, I felt like, I still have so many more records to make and so much more to say and so much more music within me. So I feel like I'm in another very, very creative spiral in my life where I just keep writing and recording. Like Radio One's coming out on July 23rd. We may be going into the studio, all pending on COVID, in August to record another new album because I've got seven, new, seven or eight new songs written for another album. <laughs> so there Amazing. you go. I'm, I'm, I'm pumped. That's great news. Yeah. I'm so pleased. I just have a couple more for you. You've been terrific. Yeah, I really sure. appreciate you. Um, and I'm so glad you, I love the jazz album. Actually, I went back and checked it out and I, I love that you did blues and other types of music. And I feel like you could kind of an opera, you could kind of do anything. There is a actual um, album coming out this summer also by uh, Marty Gabriel from Crystal Viper, Metal Queens. She's going to do a bunch of covers of heavy metal songs by women, vocalists, including Metal Queen. So how does it feel like when another artist uh, who's pretty terrific covers your work also? So <laughs> it's pretty great. I actually <laughs> heard her version and I was well, like, wow. Like I've heard various versions online or on YouTube where people have just like recorded themselves live covering it. <clears throat> but it's, um, it's not an easy song to sing. And I think she did quite a tremendous job on it actually. And um, yeah, so I'm flattered. Um, the thing that I think is actually the most unique and cute about it is you can hear her Latin accent when she's singing those lyrics. And, but, you know, in terms of wrapping her voice around those high notes and um, the, the power behind the song, I was very impressed with it. I have to tell you. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I mean, I'm, I don't know what to say. I'm flattered that she, she would choose that. Um, you know, it's, that song is meant to be, you know, an anthem of empowerment for women, you know, everywhere, not just within music. But <clears throat> when I wrote that song, um, you know, 
I, I hesitate to go on and talk about, a, you know, the whole Me Too movement, but that was my Me Too moment. I mean, I got to tell you, and I did it in 1984 when I was 21 years old. You know, I, I was like, you know, this, with all due respect to all my contemporaries and colleagues out there that are in the, the, the hard genre, you know, it was a very sexist genre, let's be honest, right? And women were portrayed as trophy women, you know, models, trophy models on the guys of their, you know, on the, the guy's arms. And, um, you know, there were a lot of videos where it's like, ah, you know, like the guys are like, you know, all the testosterone filled, filled and they're, you know, they pull their cars up and then all the bikini clad ladies come and get sprayed down with water and wash their car. And it was just like, ah, sorry, gag me. It's just like, so my feeling, and because I had gone through some very, very sexualized marketing in the beginning of my career. Um, what can I say? I was, I was a teenager. I was really young, really naive. And, um, I did some of my very awkward growing up in the public eye, you know, unfortunately that's the way it was. And so when I wrote metal queen, it was, it was definitely meant to be a pushback against that. It was like, no, we can, women can be the matriarchs. We can be in the position of power. We can wear the pants. Unfortunately though, because it was, you know, my video at that time was sandwiched in between all of these other videos. I think the message got lost. Mm -hmm. The nice thing nowadays is when I get asked about it, it's very clear and people, you know, the, the narrative of that, that tune is very clear nowadays. So that's one thing that I'm, I'm happy about. And uh, yeah, I'm glad someone's decided to cover it. Yeah, fantastic job. And again, I, I think about those times and what you came through and, and you were sort of in that very uh, rarefied air where it was like this great song, but it also had a great message and you kind of became an unintentional young feminist icon. Your, your contemporaries at the time were Joan Jett and Doro and, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's great company to be in and you were part of that great company. I, I, I look fondly on those times and not, you know, not what you only want to be remembered for, but it is a banger of a song. It still holds up. <laughs> I'm glad to say um, just for our last thing, because you had such, you know, so many trials and tribulations, if you could go back, I love to end with a wild card question. So here's mine. If you could go back and give yourself a piece of advice now, knowing what you know now, you can't, but if you could, what advice would you give young Lee Aaron starting out? The biggest piece of advice that I would give myself would be um, trust your gut and don't compromise. If I, there were times in the big, very, very infancy stages of my career where I was like, you know, like I really am not comfortable wearing these red spandex hot pants. And, you know, and my manager's going, oh yeah, but you know, we're gonna have like guys crammed up at the front of the stage and that's, you know, it, and you know what, it worked. But what message was I sending, right? And I think a lot about, about that and I feel almost embarrassed about it. This, I was trying to be a feminist, but the opposite message was being sent at the very beginning of my career. And there were times when I shouldn't have been doing that. And, um, you know, I'm not a person that has a lot of regrets. Um, I like to think of as everything as a gigantic, you know, learning curve. Um, and certainly my life and career has been that. But the other pieces of advice I would give myself would, I wish that I had learned um, recording technology much earlier in my career so that I had more, um, more control over the music. I mean, I grew up in an era where, you know, people were, they, record companies were spending like a quarter million dollars, half a million dollars making records and marketing them. They were your investor. So they had a huge say in how things were done. The wonderful thing now about digital technology, I know I'm going a little off base here, but is that, you know, I can make a record at my house. You know, I can record a keyboard part in my pajamas. And if I don't like it the next day, I can erase it and do it again. And I wish that I'd had that technology when I was younger to have more uh, complete artistic vision, you know, you know, um, over what I was doing. And uh, I have that now and it's just, it's an amazing thing. So my advice to young people is never compromise, learn about the music business because it's really important to know something about it. And number three, learn how, learn recording equipment, learn how to record yourself so that you can put your music down. Yeah. Amazing. 
amazing stuff. Leanne, thank you so much for spending some time with Ghost Call today. I am so pumped for people to hear radio on July 23rd. And uh, yeah, all the best success to you. Keep it up. And, and another new record perhaps on the way for next year. Yeah. Right here, <laughs> soon, soon as possible. Awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. It was awesome talking to you. And yeah, I'm excited for Radio On too. 